In the year 1513, Spanish conquistador Juan Ponce de Leon arrived at the east coast of a land he would give the name La Florida. The Native American presence in Florida dates back more than 12,000 years, but Spain's formal claim of this land in 1513 would set off a chain of events we are still experiencing today. In 2013, the state of Florida would observe the 500th anniversary of the landing of Ponce de Leon with a year-long itinerary of programs and activities led by the Florida Department of State called Viva Florida 500, intended to explore and promote 500 years of Florida history. An anniversary observance for the public here in Pinellas County was the Viva 500 Tampa Bay event held on March 2nd to coincide with the annual Florida Archaeology Month festivities at the Wheaton Island Preserve Cultural and Natural History Center. One of the activities on the day's program was local historian Elizabeth Neely's presentation of Maria Velasquez Conquistadora, an interpretation in period costume of the story about one of the first European women to arrive on Florida's shores. In 1528, an expedition from Spain led by conquistador Panfilo de Narvaez landed somewhere along the coast of Pinellas County, Florida to begin its ill-fated North American quest for gold, slaves, and expansion of the Spanish Empire. A marker near the jungle Prada shoreline of Boca Ciega Bay off Park Street indicates the traditional location of the expedition's landing place. Near the site of a Native American village, we know for a fact was there from archaeological evidence. The expedition's first day here was perhaps their last good day as they very quickly made enemies of the native inhabitants of this land. And moving north through Florida, the almost 300 members of the Narvaez expedition would eventually become figures in one of the great disaster dramas in the history of exploration, with ultimately only four known survivors. But traveling with the soldiers, priests, and horses landing on the shores of Pinellas County that day in April of 1528 were also some women who stayed behind as the expedition marched onward toward its doom. Wives who a strange prophecy foretold that they would soon all be widows. Among them was Maria Velasquez. Maria, good morning, good morning. Oh, it's cold outside, but I feel a little warm since I've come in. So let me take my, my cloak off. I think I'll just put it right here for now. And my gloves. This is as far as it's going, boys. I came here for the very first time, almost 500 years ago. Don't I look well for my age? I, I drank from the fountain of youth, but I do believe it's beginning to wear off, or it's been polluted. I came from Spain, a place, a city called Cuellar. It's the city where the Duke of Albuquerque has a grand castle. And as a little girl, I would play outside in the vineyards. And we'd race and run around with my friends. And at night, I would come home, and my papa would take me on his knee and call me his little princess. It was a wonderful time. And all kinds of things were happening then. There were knights in shining armor coming and going down the great Roman roads. They were going all over Christendom, for they were fighting everyone in Christendom. The place, some places at times, were shrouded in smoke, where villages were burned and the people were left without home and food. 
Well, I grew older, and at the age of 16, I was betrothed. I was betrothed to Juan Velasquez, my neighbor's son. But we didn't get married right away, for being betrothed meant that he would now have to raise enough money for my dowry. And so it was two years before Juan and I were married. In order to get a dowry, well, I would have to have all kinds of things, not just money for when I, if something happened, that I would have something left to take care of me. But I would also, I would also have to have things for my house, for my home. I would have to have all kinds of linens for my bed. I would have to have some uh, pots and pans, right? And I would have to have some, oh, <laughs> knives and forks, and of course furniture. There was a lot of things that Juan would have to get for me before we would get married. Well, the problem of it was that Juan can't, was the third son of a third son. So he had no inheritance. He would have to go out and earn his fortune. And so what he did is that he joined the king's army. He became a conquistador, and he would follow those armies all over Christendom. Finally, he came home, and we were married. Well, no sooner than we were married, he was off down to the village pub and telling his friends there what a great soldier he was. Well, one night while he was there, someone came to the pub. They had a drum, ba-dum, 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 and they announced that he was getting an expedition together for the governor, Pomphia de Narvaez, to go and build a new city in a place far across the ocean sea, a place they called Florida. That night, Juan came home. He said, Maria, Maria, uh, I need 18 ducats from your dowry. I said, what do you mean, 18 ducats? He said, we're going on a trip. We are going to found a city in the New Spain, in a place called La Florida. No one has ever settled there before. And I understand, I am told, that the streets are paved with gold there. Oh, I had heard stories. I had heard stories, plenty of stories, about people who had gone to the New Spain. Oh yes, some of them did come back. Some of them came back with a lot of money, a lot of gold. Riches beyond belief, if they survived. And there were many who did not survive these great journeys. And of course, I was concerned. I argued with Juan, trying to beg him, beg him, please do not go, please do not take us there. And he said, oh, nonsense, woman. We are going to be rich beyond belief. And so the next few days were spent packing what few belongings I could take with me. And then we left. I said goodbye to my sister and to my mama and my papa. I feared that I would never see them again. And we walked along that old Roman road down towards the city of Sevilla. It was exciting. We'd walk through and walked along, and at night we would camp along the roadside. And at night you could hear the wolves howling in the mountains beyond. We walked through the cork fields. Those are the trees of, that gave us cork for our shoes and for many other things. It was the springtime, and so the lavender was in bloom. And it smelled so wonderful walking through those fields. 
And finally, we reached the city of Sevilla. Oh, I had never seen anything like it. There were people from all over the world. There were along the river. There were lots and lots and lots of piles and piles of riches coming back from the Americas. Mile after mile piled high with gold and, and jewels, pearls, and all kinds of riches. Cloth was coming in from the Orient to add to the cloth that we already had. The be it, was, it was astounding. But we did not stay there. We got on a barge and went down to the coast. The Sevilla is inland. And so we had to take the river, Guevara, down to the coast. And there we went to a little town called San Lucar de Baramida. Now San Lucar is where all the expeditions would leave from. It was a small town. There was no place for us to stay there either. And so we were camped in a, in a tent village outside of the town. Before we left, I went to, to see a woman, a woman who was a soothsayer. And she read my cards, cards just like these. These are the Spanish tarot cards. And she read my cards, and she said to me, Maria, this is a dangerous thing that you do as if I didn't know that. But then she said to me, you must build a city where you land or all will be doomed. Oh, that gave me cold chills to hear those words, but I, I tucked them away and remembered that. Then after I went to see the woman of her nachos, was her name, the soothsayer, I went to the church to pray. It was called the Chapel of O. And I inquired as to why they called it the Chapel of O. And they told me it was named after our Blessed Virgin, Mary. For when Mary was approached by the archangel and told that she was pregnant with the baby Jesus, she said, oh, and so they named the chapel O after that. This is the chapel that all sailors and all conquistadors went before they sailed off for the new Spain. The next day, we boarded the ships. Now, it wasn't exactly like you just got on a ship. You had to take a small boat out to the ship because the ships were beyond a, a, a barrier in the water, a sand, a, 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 actually a, a rock bar that was there, and the ships could not get over it, so you had to take a small boat. Now, I'm dressed like this, and I have to climb overboard. I can tell you it was not easy. I also was not allowed, once I got on board, to wear my chopins. These are my chopins. They keep my skirts out of the mud. They keep my skirts from getting dirty because the streets at that time were not very nice. People would throw their slops out into the streets. And it didn't smell very well, good at that time either. So I also carried this. I'm going to see if I can take this off and you can smell it too. Let me see if I can do that. Nope, it's tied in a knot. But what I will do is I will give you, oh, it did fall off, thank you. <laughs> that was convenient. Okay, so I'm gonna pass this along and you take a sniff. This, that one has lavender in it and it's called a pomodor. Or I'm sorry, a pomander. <laughs> this is some extra lavender that I picked when I was going along that old road. Once on board, since I didn't have uh, could not wear them. My feet were going to be very slippery on those wet decks. They issued me a pair of rope sandals. 
everyone was issued rope sandals to wear on the deck, like this. On board, we would cluster around in groups, try to make a few friends. Now you have to understand, I am a lady. I'm not used to going out in public without an escort. In fact, I would never have set out on this expedition without my husband, or at least a father or an uncle to accompany me. I would always be chaperoned at all times to be a proper lady. And here I am on deck. There's no place for me to stay. I have to sleep on deck, exposed to the elements, and worse, exposed to the sailors. And so I found out that if you bribe the ship's carpenter, he would build you a little shelter. And it would have a little, a little wood shelter and a little bit of canvas over it, and I could have some privacy. For at home, if my father had invited somebody over, I would have to stay behind a screen. I was never exposed to gentlemen of my village. And if I went outside, I would always keep my head covered with only a little bit of uh, space to be able to see up. So this was really, really very different for me. And I was going to be on the ship for many, many weeks. So off we go. The first thing we do is we have to stop at the Canary Islands to pick up water, water that's kept in olive jars, much bigger than this. This is a small one, but they would keep them in olive jars, and they would seal it with some wax, and that's what you would have to drink. Oh, let me tell you about the water. After a while, it gets a little old. You know, this green slime gets all over it. And, the, oh yeah, exactly. And then you would have to pour a little wine in with it just so you could drink it. But you had to drink something, right? You couldn't drink the seawater. And so that's what we would have. Now, how old are you? Eight. Eight, and how old are you? Eight. Eight. How old are you? You're too young. These guys would be the same age as the ship's boys on that caravel. The ship's boys would come aboard and they would take care of things. You know, they would bring us our food. When the mountain's bell rang, we would say prayers, and then they would bring out these large trays filled with beans. If we were lucky, we might get a joint of meat if a horse died that day. Because we didn't bring any meat with us on this particular expedition. Thank you. And so, we would eat, let me show you what we ate. Lots and lots of beans. You know what we had for breakfast? Beans. Let me give you a few, you can ha pass them around. You wanna pass them around? These are called chickpeas or garbanzo beans. You can pass those around. And we'd have big pots of that cooked with pork fat. After a while, the pork fat didn't taste so good either. You know what the, sometimes, what the sailors ate? Rats, always lots of rats on a ship. And they would catch the rats and cook them over the fire. The fire was in a little iron uh, stove, just a small little kind of, uh, stove that held some coals. We would pick up coals at Canary Islands too. And they would roast, the, the sailors would roast those rats over the fire. They thought those were delicious. Well, I guess if you're hungry. Now, the other thing that we got to eat, oh, mmm, ship's biscuits. Hard as rocks. Look. Of course, sometimes you'd have to do that just to get the weevils out of them, the worms that get in the ship's biscuits. But this is what you ate. But you couldn't eat it like this because it would break your teeth. And our teeth weren't very good then anyway. 
So, because we had no dentists. So, what we did is that we would soak it in some water and make them soft enough so that we could eat them. This is baked twice in order to uh, get them that hard, and it helps preserve them. It keeps them from going bad. And sailors for years and years and years, actually right up until recently, even they, they've been eating these ship's biscuits. Here we go. I'll pass one this way. Enjoy them. Okay. What else did we have on ship? Now, oh, thank you. Got my pomander. Do you know why we carried these pomanders? Because if you went outside, a lady really did not like the smell of what was in the streets. And they also help keep our clothes smelling better. What else would we do on a ship? Well, let's see. We would have to find, I mean, we're at ship for days and days and days at a time, for weeks. So what we did was we had to play games. We, sometimes, of course I didn't, but the men would play dice and cards and Mancala was a popular game at the time. And let me see. And there was, of course, a lot of gambling going on. What the sergeant of arms would do when you came on board, they'd say, come here, give me your cards. And he would take the cards from you because he didn't want the cards to be marked, OK? So what he did was he took the cards away from you and then and because it was against the law to bring cards on the deck, on the ship. So he would take them, and then he would sell you a new deck of cards. It was a little extra uh, way he made a little extra cash, too. Now, you know, on ships, things can get pretty rough, especially with sailors who've been drinking and gambling, and somebody might be a poor loser. So the other thing that the sergeants of arms might do is when you came aboard, he would chop the end of your knife off. So you can cut your meat and use it for things that sailors need to do, but you're not able to stick it into somebody. So that was another thing that was done on the ship. Well, sailors were everywhere, of course, and you could always tell a sailor by his red hat, especially if they were ashore, and also their blue suits. They would wear uh, slops and loose-fitting clothing and the red hat. So if you were in the city of Sevilla or any of the cities, the coastal cities in, in Cuba or Santo Domingo, you could tell who the sailors were. And uh, they were usually easy to track down if they had uh, got into trouble some way. On the ship, I probably would not have worn my farthingale because it's just a little difficult to maneuver and you don't have that much strength. Think of a, a ship just a little bit bigger than this room with about 150 people on it. That's very crowded. And so you would have to try to keep everything uh, pretty close together. So I would probably have not have worn this. But I, that's okay. I've got lots of other skirts. I have one skirt and two skirts, and three, and gentlemen, close your eyes. I have my underwear. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing that I would probably wear from time to time, depending on the weather, would be my drawers. Now, unlike other places in uh, Europe, women in Spain wore drawers. And sometimes, and they were very mu built very much like a gentleman's. You would have this in order to keep it on. Uh, this is like a belt, but it's tied to them, so that helps hold them up. And you have this little flap that comes up like this, called a codpiece. Now, a funny story, sometimes these codpieces were left open and you could carry stuff in them, you know. Uh, one gentleman was caught at one time. Well, he wasn't so much of a gentleman. 
he was a thief, and he had stolen a chicken. And the chicken was moving around in his drawers like that. And so the thief was caught. <laughs> we also, wool. Wool is a really important thing in Spain. In fact, before they found the Americas, the wool was called the Golden Fleece of Spain. And it was a very uh, important thing. It was their biggest market that they would trade with other people, other countries. And so that was a very important thing. This is a 16th century uh, man's shirt that he would wear under his doublet to keep warm. Women would walk around. You can see I'm not very experienced at this. I have servants that do my wool spinning. But they would carry a spindle at all times and walk around like this, spinning. And some, some places in Spain, they had hats that came up like this, and they would keep two or three spindles up in their hat, so they'd always have something, something with them to spin. And so that was another thing. The other thing that women would make was, was flax. And even, uh, uh, turn flax into linen. This is linen. And even the queen, actually, the higher your rank, the more that you would do. Uh, and the more fine your, your linen would be. Because if you were the king's wife, you would want the king to have the finest linen in the land. And you didn't trust that to servants. You actually spun it and made it yourself. Okay. So we're at sea. We've been at sea for a long, long time. You know, it took us six weeks to reach Santo Domingo. I don't know what took us so long. You know, it only took Columbus on his first journey a month, and he didn't know where he was going. Finally, we reached Santo Domingo, and we put ashore there. 150 men left the expedition right then and there. They decided not to go on to the Florida. They were promised land and riches right there in Santo Domingo, and they decided to stay there. And so it was a few days, and finally we took on some supplies, but all our horses had died on the way over, so we had to get new horses. And we were told that there was a place in Cuba that would sell us horses. And so we put to sea again, those of us that were left on this expedition. And then we went to Santiago de Cuba. When we reached there, we were told the gentleman that had the horses lived in a place called Alternidad, Cuba. And so Cabeza de Baca, the ship's treasurer, left with a ship to go there. The rest of us stayed in Santo Domingo. And what happened was that once we got there, once they got there, a huge storm came up. Some of them had left the ship and gone on land to look for the horses. And this storm blew so furiously that the men had to hold arms, nine, ten at a time, just to keep from being blown away. Everything in that city was blown away. And finally, the following day, they went to look for the ship. There was nothing left but a few pieces of lumber and some bodies floating in the water. None on the ship had survived. They had been dashed upon the rocks, and none of them were recognizable. That's when we learned of the season of El Hurricane, something we had never experienced in Spain. We were so upset about the loss of the ship and the loss of some of our friends that we begged the governor, please, please, do not put to sea again during this season. And so we spent the winter in a place called Zuega. In the spring, we gathered together again and put to sea. The governor had hired a, a, 
a man named Diego Murillo to be our navigator. Well, some navigator he turned out to be, for the very first thing he did was get our ships stuck on the sands of Canero. And there we rested for almost two weeks until another storm came and flooded those sands and lifted us up and out to sea again. We sailed around the south part of Cuba and we were hit by another storm. And then we sailed, we were trying to make it to Habana because that's where the governor's wife had been staying, managing his land and his estates while he was getting this expedition together. But a storm came up and we never did get to Habana. We were blown across the Straits of Florida and up the coast until we finally reached our destination, the Bay of Espiritu Santos. You know it as Tampa Bay. It was Good Friday, April 1528. In the, at the mouth of the bay, there was an island, and we were able to trade for trinkets and uh, fish there with the natives that were on that island. So we were able to exchange the trinkets for fish there. And so I had never seen people like this before. They had dark skins and wore no clothes. It was very shocking, I can tell you. And so the next day we sailed into the bay. Well, Diego Murillo did it again. He got us lost. It was not the great bay of Espiritu Santos but a much smaller bay, a bay we now call the Boca Ciega Bay. And there on the shore was a great village. There was a house there, a building that could hold over 300 people on that there. And I looked around. We went to shore and people started looking around. There were no people there. They had fled in their canoes the night before for they had heard of the likes of the Spanish coming. And so we spent several days there. I can assure you the streets were not paved with gold. In fact, there was no gold to be found anywhere except for a little gold bell wrapped up in some fishing net. That was it. There was barely any food to be had. And so the governor sent the ship's treasurer and some other men to go exploring the area. And yes, they said, indeed, they found the much larger bay, the Bay of Espiritu Santos, and came back a few days hence and told us of that. At that time, the governor decided that this was not a good place for us to stay. We should not build our city here. And that he brought people together and said that they were going on. They were going to go explore, going to find that city of gold. And so this is when I decided it was time for me to speak to the governor. Do you remember what I had learned back in Spain from the soothsayer? Does anybody remember? What? Uh, build your town where you'll land or everybody will land. That's right. Build our town our city, where we land, or everyone will be doomed. Well, I told this to the governor. Do you know what he said to me? Nonsense, woman. Of course, people are going to die on the expedition, but those of us that survive will be rich beyond belief. And so I returned to the ship, myself and the nine other women that were with me returned to the ship, and we stood there and watched as our husbands marched off into the wilderness, never to be seen again. In order to be fed and to be taken care of and treated with respect, myself and the nine other women chose to marry men that remained behind on the ship. 
We sailed back to Cuba. And it was a number of years, many years, before I found out what happened to my Juan. It seems that he was the first man who was killed on the expedition. He was trying to cross a raging river. He was on his horse, the horse much weakened by the journey. And they were both swept away because the river was in flood. I understand that they had a good meal of horse meat that night. But I never saw Juan again. The rest of the expedition, I finally learned what happened to them. Cabeza de Baca and three other gentlemen, one a slave named Esteban, returned to tell a fantastic tale. It seems that the governor and, and the expedition had reached an area in, in North Florida called St. Mark's. And they were forced to build some, some ships, small ships there, small, small boats, because they never did see any of the supply ships again. And they built these small boats or rafts, and they pushed them out to sea. The Cabeza de Vaca tried and pleaded with the governor, please, please, let's pull these together. Let's work together. We may be able to survive. And the governor said, nonsense. And he pushed off his, his boat. And he was never seen again. Cabeza de Vaca's boat was finally landed in a place called uh, the Isle of Sorrows, a place you know as Galveston today. He was washed up on that island, and the native people there were so sad to see these people that they sat down beside them, and they wept. And then they led them to their village. Cabeza de Baca said that he was made a slave by these people for a few years. He was probably just asked, being asked to do his share of the work, for they had very little there. In fact, their biggest feast would be when the Opuntia came into, into uh, season, and they would collect all the little buds off the Opuntia, the prickly pear, and they would feast on those. And so, from there on, in a few years, they would leave that village. He and Esteban and the two other gentlemen would leave this village, and they would travel all across this great continent, almost to the Bay of California, and then down into Mexico, where they were rescued by Spanish people there. At first, they didn't recognize them because by that time, they had really gone native, and they weren't dressed properly. And so they were almost killed. But they said, we're Christians, we're Christians. And finally, they were recognized and saved. Cabeza de Vaca goes back to Spain, and he writes the very first book ever written about this country. He, it was a time before anyone had actually seen what this place was like from Europe. It was an amazing time, an amazing book. And if you ever have a chance, you should read it. It's not that long, but it tells stories that you could not even begin to understand. And that's the story, that's my story, of Maria Velasquez, Spanish conquistadora. I now give you an opportunity to ask questions, if you like. I'm. Uh, no longer Maria, I'm going to go become Elizabeth, and uh, I'm happy to ask any questions. I also have some other things that are outside. Yes? Can you um, tell us what happened to uh, Panfilo de Narvaez? Panfilo de Narvaez, we believe, was lost at sea. He was never heard of again. From now, which point? I where uh, he left, after he left St. Mark's, when they pushed so off with a... St. Mark's crew and then... Yeah. That's where they kind of spent some time up in that area getting their act together, waiting for those ships to, 
rendezvous with them, but they never did. Now they had walked up, they'd taken a really bad route to go up there. And there was a lot, they went through like the ma mangroves and the swamps and things like that. They weren't like the Sodu who probably f followed a Native American trail up the center of the state. So it was pretty rigorous and people started dying pretty quickly. There's one section of the book where they say they, some of them resorted to eating each other. Uh, I don't know, you know, but that, that's part of it. So, yeah, he took... Food, right, right. Well, I hear, uh, I read a later journal by, uh, uh, of St. Augustine, and in the first years of St. Augustine, there was a woman who starved to death there because she didn't want to eat the scum and vermin of this land. So they, you know, they were willing to eat lots of salt pork and beans, but uh, lobster and shrimp and oysters and deer and all those good things that were available were considered scum and vermin. There, are, I know people today. I mean, I had a friend that went to uh, <laughs> that went to China. He wasn't about to eat any of their food. You know, he was looking for the next McDonald's. So, you know, there are people that are like that. You know, they'd starve to death rather than eat the eat the, the local food. Yes. Were these uh, children you referred to as the boat boys? Were they the uh, children of the passengers or the orphans or what they Okay. Uh, the the deal was uh, even on um, Pont Juan Ponce de Leon, he had nine or ten ships boys there. And they were orphaned. Uh, a lot of them were or orphaned or they may have been a child of sailor, you know, but for the most part they were orphaned. By the mid sixteenth century we know that fift, almost 50% of the women in Seville were either win, widowed or abandoned. And their children became street urchins. If they were lucky, they might get a job in someone's house as a, as a servant or something like that. But the boys had an opportunity to be able to, if they were in the right circle, I guess, to go to sea and learn a trade. And they would, from the age of about eight up until about 12, 13 or so, they would be ship's boys, and then they, after that they would uh, uh, become apprentices, and if they survived that, they would become a, uh, uh, a sailor, and they could work their way up to being a captain or even a ship's owner, you know, if they survived long enough. I mean, we know how many ships have sunk over the years, so survival rate was not great sometimes. So. But yeah, that was an important part. And they did a lot of the chores that on the ship. They weren't given really, really hard jobs until they you know, got older, but they were given a lot of chores. And feeding the passengers was one of the things. They didn't cook the food, but they brought the food out. And the other thing that was interesting I found out about ships was uh, how, uh, how groups that came from same, same ethnic groups, they all had to be Christian. That was one rule. You, you, you didn't survive uh, if you weren't a Christian. But uh, you could be from any part of Europe at that time. You could be German, you could be Greek, you could be Italian, uh, Portuguese, or of course were the big sailors. But they could all be on the ships. But, and they would sometimes, because they had similar culture and language and so on, they would form what they called ranchos on the ship, and they would take their, uh, their ship's boxes, their um, sea chests, and they'd put them in a little corral. And that's where they lived, was groups of people would live like that. The other thing I always get asked about that I, is, how do you go to the bathroom on a ship like that? Because there were no heads at that time. Uh, well, it was, it was an adventure, and what you would do would be you'd have to crawl up over the, the uh, ship at the front, the bow of the ship, and there was a net down there, and you'd kind of get your toes wrapped into that, that net and do your thing and hope that the wind wasn't blowing the wrong way that day. So you know, it's, 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 it's exciting learning about, because you didn't have, they, they, there's one account that I read that People were very, very upset because people had been using chamber pots on the ship. 
and they started to roll, <laughs> and it wasn't pleasant. And there's, I have a whole great book just on that subject alone. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Yes. It's called La Relacion. It's the account of Cabeza de Vaca, Nunez Cabeza de Vaca, and uh, La Relacion. And I meant to bring a couple extra copies today. I do have them. The, the best copy I got was a, one of the most recent translations by Martin Fernandez and Horn, uh, Jose. Oh, I can't think of his name right now, I'm sorry. But anyway, it's, I have some extra copies. If you want to contact me, I can get them because you have to go through a circuitous route in order to be able to purchase them. They're just not available everywhere these days. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much for joining me.